Book One, Chapter Six of the World's Desire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rick Vino. The World's Desire by H. Ryder Haggard. Book One, Chapter Six. The Story of Meriamun. Ray, the priest of Amen, the master builder, began his story unwillingly enough, and slowly, but soon he took pleasure in telling it, as old men do, and in sharing the burden of a secret. The queen is fair, he said. Thou hast seen no fairer in all thy voyagings? She is fair indeed, answered the wanderer. I pray that she be well mated, and happy on her throne? That is what I will tell thee of, though my life may be the price of the tale, said Ray. But a lighter heart is well worth an old man's cheap risk, and thou mayst help me and her when thou knowest all. Pharaoh Menepta, her lord, the king, is the son of the divine Ramses, the ever-living Pharaoh, child of the sun, who dwelleth in Osiris. Thou meanest that he is dead? asked the wanderer. He dwelleth with Osiris, said the priest, and the queen, Meriamun, was his daughter by another bed. A brother wed a sister, exclaimed the wanderer. It is the custom of our royal house, from the days of the timeless kings, the children of Horus, an old custom. The ways of his hosts are good in the eyes of a stranger, said the wanderer courteously. It is an old custom, and a sacred, said Ray. But women, the custom makers, are often custom breakers, and of all women, Meriamun least loves to be obedient, even to the dead, and yet she has obeyed, and it came about thus. Her brother, Menepta, who now is Pharaoh, the prince of Cush, while her divine father lived, had many half-sisters, but Meriamun was the fairest of them all. She is beautiful, a moon-child, the common people called her, and wise, and she does not know the face of fear, and thus it chanced that she learned what even our royal women rarely learn, all the ancient secret wisdom of this ancient land. Except Queen Taya of old, no woman has known what Meriamun knows, what I have taught her, I and another counsellor. He paused here, and his mind seemed to turn on unhappy things. I have taught her from childhood, he went on. Would that I had been her only familiar, and after her divine father and mother, she loved me more than any, for she loved few. But of all whom she did not love, she loved her royal brother least. He is slow of speech, and she is quick. She is fearless, and he has no heart for war. From her childhood she scorned him, mocked him, and mastered him with her tongue. She even learned to excel him in the chariot races. Therefore it was that the king his father made him but a general of the foot soldiers, and in guessing riddles which our people love she delighted to conquer him. 
the victory was easy enough, for the divine prince is heavy-witted, but Meriamun was never tired of girding at him. Plainly, even as a little child, she grudged that he should come to wield the scourge of power and wear the double crown, while she should live in idleness and hunger for command. It is strange, then, that of all his sisters, if one must be queen, he should have chosen her, said the wanderer. Strange, and it happened strangely. The prince's father, the divine Ramses, had willed the marriage. The prince hated it no less than Meriamun, but the will of a father is the will of the gods. In one sport the divine prince excelled. In the game of pieces, an old game in Ken. It is no pastime for women, but even at this Meriamun was determined to master her brother. She bade me carve her a new set of the pieces, fashioned with the heads of cats, and shaped from the hard wood of Azebi. I carved them with my own hands, and night by night she played with me, who have some name for skill at the sport. One sunset it chanced that her brother came in from hunting the lion in the Libyan hills. He was in an evil humor, for he had found no lions, and he caused the huntsmen to be stretched out and beaten with rods. Then he called for wine and drank deep at the palace gate, and the deeper he drank, the darker grew his humor. He was going to his own court in the palace, striking with a whip at his hounds, when he chanced to turn and see Meriamun. She was sitting where those three great palm trees are, and was playing at pieces with me in the cool of the day. There she sat in the shadow, clad in white and purple, and with the red gold of the snake of royalty in the blackness of her hair. There she sat, as beautiful as the Hathor, the queen of love, or as the lady Isis, when she played at pieces in Amenti with the ancient king. Nay, an old man may say it, there never was but one woman more fair than Meriamun, if a woman she be, she whom our people call the strange Hathor. Now the wanderer bethought him of the tale of the pilot, but he said nothing, and Ray went on. The prince saw her, and his anger sought for something new to break itself on. Up he came, and I rose before him and bowed myself. But Meriamun fell indolently back in her chair of ivory, and with a sweep of her slim hand she disordered the pieces, and bade her waiting woman, the Lady Hataska, gather up the board and carry all away. But Hataska's eyes were secretly watching the prince. Greeting, princess, our royal sister said Menepta. What art thou doing with these? And he pointed with his chariot whip at the cat-headed pieces. This is no woman's game. These pieces are not soft hearts of men to be moved on the board by love. This game needs wit. Get thee to thy broidery, for there thou mayst excel. Greeting, Prince, our royal brother, said Meriamun. I laugh to hear thee speak of a game that needs wit. Thy hunting has not prospered, so get thee to the banquet board, for there, I hear, the gods have granted thee to excel. It is little to say, answered the Prince, 
throwing himself into a chair whence I had risen. It is little to say, but at the game of pieces I have enough wit to give thee a temple, a priest, and five bowmen, and yet win. For these, O wanderer, are the names of some of the pieces. I take the challenge, cried Meriamun, for now she had brought him where she wanted. But I will take no odds. Here is my wager. I will play thee three games, and stake the sacred circlet upon my brow against the royal Urias on thine, and the winner shall wear both. Nay, nay, lady, I was bold to say. This were too high a stake. High or low, I accept the wager, answered the prince. This sister of mine has mocked me too long. She shall find that her woman's wit cannot match me at my own game, and that my father's son, the royal prince of Kush, and the pharaoh who shall be, is more than the equal of a girl. I hold thy wage, Meriamun. Go then, prince, she cried, and after sunset meet me in my antechamber. Bring a scribe to score the games. Ray shall be the judge, and hold the stakes. But beware of the golden cup of Pasht. Drain it not to-night, lest I win a love game, though we did not play for love. The prince went scowling away, and Meriamun laughed, but I foresaw mischief. The stakes were too high, the match was too strange, but Meriamun would not listen to me, for she was very willful. The sun fell, and two hours after the royal prince of Kush came with his scribe, and found Meriamun with the board of squares before her, in her antechamber. He sat down without a word, then he asked, who should first take the field? Wait, she said, first let us set the stakes, and lifting from her brow the golden snake of royalty, she shook her soft hair loose, and gave the coronet to me. If I lose, she said, never may I wear the Urias crown. That shalt thou never, while I draw breath, answered the prince, as he too lifted the symbol of his royalty from his head, and gave it to me. There was a difference between the circlets. The coronet of Meriamun was crowned with one crested snake, that of the divine prince was crowned with twain. I, Menepta, she said, but perchance Osiris, god of the dead, waits thee, for surely he loves those too great and good for earth. Take thou the field and to the play. At her words of evil omen he frowned, but he took the field and readily for he knew the game well. She moved in answer heedlessly enough, and afterwards she played at random and carelessly, pushing the pieces about with little skill, and so he won this first game quickly, and crying, Pharaoh is dead, swept the pieces from the board. See how I better thee, he went on in mockery. Thine is a woman's game, all attack and no defense. Boast not yet, Menepta, she said. There are still two sets to play. See, the board is set, and I take the field. This time the game went differently, for the prince could scarce make a prisoner of a single piece save of one temple and two bowmen only, and presently it was the turn of Meriamun to cry, Pharaoh is dead, 
and to sweep the pieces from the board. This time Minepta did not boast, but scowled, while I set the board, and the scribe wrote down the game upon his tablets. Now it was the prince's turn to take the field. In the name of holy Thoth, he cried, to whom I vow great gifts of victory. In the name of holy Pasht, she made answer, to whom I make daily prayer. For, being a maid, she swore by the goddess of chastity, and being Meriamun, by the goddess of vengeance. Tis fitting thou shouldst vow by her of the cat's head, he said, sneering. Yes, very fitting, she answered for perchance she'll lend me her claws. Play thou, Prince Menepta. And he played, and so well, that for a while the game went against her. But at length, when they had struggled long, and Meriamun had lost the most of her pieces, a light came into her face, as though she had found what she sought. And while the prince called for wine and drank she lay back in her chair and looked upon the board then she moved so shrewdly and upon so deep a plan that he fell into the trap that she had laid for him and could never escape in vain he vowed gifts to the holy thoth and promised such a temple as there was none in Kem. Thoth hears thee not. He is the god of lettered men, said Meriamun, mocking him. Then he cursed and drank more wine. Fools seek wit in wine, but only wise men find it, quoth she again. Behold, royal brother, Pharaoh is dead, and I have won the match, and beaten thee at thine own game. Ray, my servant, give me that circlet, nay, not my own, the double one, which the divine prince wagered. So set it on my brow, for it is mine, Minepta. In this, as in all things else, I have conquered thee. And she rose, and standing full in the light of the lamps, the royal Urias on her brow, she mocked him, bidding him come do homage to her who had won his crown, and stretching forth her small hand for him to kiss it, and so wondrous was her beauty that the divine prince of Cush ceased to call upon the evil gods because of his ill fortune, and stood gazing on her. By Pata, but thou art fair, he cried, and I pardon my father at last for willing thee to be my queen. But I will never pardon him, said Meriam. Now the prince had drunk much wine. Thou shalt be my queen, he said, and for earnest I will kiss thee. This at the least being the strongest I can do. And ere she could escape him, he passed his arm about her, and seized her by the girdle, and kissed her on the lips, and let her go. Meriamun grew white as the dead. By her side there hung a dagger. Swiftly she drew it, and swiftly struck at his heart so that had he not shrunk from the steel, surely he had been slain. And she cried as she struck, Thus, prince, I pay thy kisses back. But as it chanced, she only pierced his arm, and before she could strike again, I had seized her by the hand. Thou serpent, said the prince, pale with rage and fear, I tell thee I will kiss thee, yet 
whether thou wilt or not, and thou shalt pay for this. But she laughed softly now that her anger was spent, and I led him forth to seek a physician who should bind up his wound. And when he was gone, I returned and spoke to her, wringing my hands. O oh, royal lady, what hast thou done? Thou knowest well that thy divine father destines thee to wed the prince of Cush, whom but now thou didst smite so fiercely. Nay, Ray, I will none of him, the dull clod who is called the son of Pharaoh. Moreover, he is my half-brother, and it is not meet that I should wed my brother, for nature cries aloud against the custom of the land. Nevertheless, lady, it is the custom of thy royal house, and thy father's will. Thus the gods, thine ancestors, were wed, Isis to Osiris. Thus great Thothmes and Amenemhat did, and decreed, and all their forefathers, and all their seed. O, oh, bethink thee, I speak it for thine ear, for I love thee as mine own daughter. Bethink thee, for thou canst not escape, that Pharaoh's bed is the step to Pharaoh's throne. Thou lovest power, here is the gate of power, and mayhap upon a time the master of the gate shall be gone, and thou shalt sit in the gate alone. Ah, Ray, now thou speakest like the counsellor of those who would be kings. Oh, did I not hate him with this hatred, and yet can I rule him? Why, t'was no chance game that we played this night. The future lay upon the board. See, his diadem is upon my brow. At first he won, for I chose that he should win. Well, so mayhap it shall be. Mayhap I shall give myself to him, hating him the while. And then the next game, that shall be for life and love and all things dear, and I shall win it, and mine shall be the Urias crest, and mine shall be the double crown of ancient Kem, and I shall rule like Hatshepu, the great queen of old, for I am strong, and to the strong is victory. Yes, I made answer, but lady, see thou that the gods turn not thy strength to weakness. Thou art too passionate to be all strength, and in a woman's heart passion is the door by which king folly enters. Today thou hatest. Beware, lest tomorrow thou shouldst love. Love, she said, gazing scornfully. Meriamun loves not till she find a man worthy of her love. Ay, and then? And then she loves to all destruction, and woe to them who cross her path. Ray, farewell. Then suddenly she spoke to me in another tongue that few know save her and me, and that none can read save her and me, a dead tongue of a dead people, the people of that ancient city of the rock whence all our fathers came. I go, she said, and I trembled as she spoke, for no man speaks in this language when he has any good thought in his heart. I go to seek the counsel of that thou knowest. And she touched the golden snake which she had won. Then I threw myself on the earth at her feet, and clasped her knees, crying, 
my daughter, my daughter, sin not this great sin. Nay, for all the kingdom of the world, wake not that which sleepeth, nor warm again into life that which is a cold. But she only nodded and put me from her, and the old man's face grew pale as he spoke. What meant she? said the wanderer. Nay, wake not thou, that which sleepeth, wanderer, he said at length. My tongue is sealed. I tell thee more that I would tell another. Do not ask, but hark, they come again. Now may Ra and Pasht and Amen curse them. May the red swine's mouth of Set gnaw upon them in Amenti. May the fish of Sebek flesh his teeth of stone in them for ever, and feed and feed again. Why dost thou curse thus, Ray? And who are they that go by? said the wanderer. I hear their tramping and their song. Indeed, there came a light noise of many shuffling feet, pattering outside the palace wall, and the words of a song rang out triumphantly. The Lord our God, he doth sign and wonder, tokens he shows in the land of Chem. He hath shattered the pride of the kings asunder, and casteth his shoe or the gods of them. He hath brought forth frogs in their holy places. He hath sprinkled the dust upon crown and hem. He hath hated their kings, and hath darkened their faces. Wonders he works in the land of Chem. These are the accursed, blaspheming conjurers and slaves, the Apura said ray as the music and the tramping died away their magic is greater than the lore even of us who are instructed for their leader was one of ourselves a shaven priest and knows our wisdom never do they march and sing thus but evil comes of it ere day dawn we shall have news of them May the gods destroy them. They are gone for the hour. It were well if Meriamun the queen would let them go for ever, as they desire, to their death in the desert. But she hardens the king's heart. End of Book One Chapter Six Book One, Chapter Seven of The World's Desire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Cushney. The World's Desire by H. Ryder Haggard. Book One, Chapter Seven. THE QUEEN'S VISION There was silence without at last. The clamor and the tread of the opera were hushed in the distance, dying far away, and Ray grew calm, when he heard no longer the wild song and the clashing of the timbrels. "'I must tell thee, Epiritus, he said, how the matter ended between the divine prince and Meriamun. She bowed her pride before her father and her brother. Her father's will was hers. She seemed to let her secret sleep, and she set her own price on her hand. In everything she must be the equal of Pharaoh. That was her price. And in all the temples and all the cities she was to be solemnly proclaimed joint heir with him of the upper and lower land. The bargain was struck and the price was paid. 
After that night over the game of pieces, Meriamun was changed. Thenceforth, she did not mock at the prince. She made herself gentle and submissive to his will. So the time drew on, till at length in the beginning of the rising of the waters came the day of her bridal. With a mighty pomp was Pharaoh's daughter wedded to Pharaoh's son. But her hand was cold as she stood at the altar, cold as the hand of one who sleeps in Osiris. Proudly and coldly she sat in the golden chariot, passing in and out the great gates of Tanis. Only when she listened and heard the acclaiming thousands cry Meriamun so loudly that the cry of Meneptah was lost in the echoes of her name, then only did she smile. Cold, too, she sat in her white robes at the feast that Pharaoh made, and she never looked at the husband by her side, though he looked kindly on her. The feast was long, but it ended at last, and then came the music and the singers. But Meriamun, making excuse, rose and went out, attended by her ladies. And I also, weary and sad at heart, passed thence to my own chamber and busied myself with the instruments of my art, for, stranger, I build the houses of gods and kings. Presently, as I sat, there came a knocking at the door, and a woman entered wrapped in a heavy cloak. She put aside the cloak, and before me was Meriamun in all her bridal robes. Heed me not, Ray, she said. I am yet free for an hour, and I would watch thee at thy labor. Nay, it is my humor. Gainsay me not, for I love well to look on that wrinkled face of thine, scored by the cunning chisel of thy knowledge and thy years. So from a child have I watched thee tracing the shapes of mighty temples that shall endure when ourselves and perchance the very gods we worship have long since ceased to be. Ah, Ray, thou wise man, thine is the better part, for thou buildest in cold enduring stone, and attirest thy walls as thy fancy bids thee. But I, I build in the dust of human hearts, and my will is written in their dust. When I am dead, Raise me a tomb more beautiful than ever has been known, and write upon the portal, Here in the last temple of her pride dwells that tired builder, Meriamun the queen. Thus she talked wildly in words with little reason. Nay, speak not so, I said, for is it not thy bridal night? What dost thou hear at such a time? What do I hear? Surely I come to be a child again. See, Ray, in all wide chem there is no woman so shamed, so lost, so utterly undone as is to-night the royal Meriamun whom thou lovest. I am lower than she who plies the street for bread, for the loftier the spirit, the greater is the fall. I am sold into shame, and power is my price. O oh, cursed be the fate of woman, who only by her beauty can be great. O oh, cursed be that ancient counsellor thou wottest of, and cursed be I, who wakened that which slept, and warm that which was a cold in my breath and in my breast. And cursed be this sin to which he led me. Spurn me, Ray, strike me on the cheek, spit upon me, on Meriamun, the royal harlot who sells herself to win a crown. Oh, I hate him, hate him, and I will pay him in shame for shame, him the clown in king's attire. See here. And from her robe she drew a white flower that was known to her and me. Twice today I have been minded with this 
deadly blossom to make an end of me and of all my shame and all my empty greed of glory. But this thought has held my hand. I, Meriamun, will live to look across his grave and break his images and beat out the writings of his name from every temple wall in Kem as they beat out the hated name of Ahat Shepu. I... And suddenly she burst into a rain of tears, she who was not wont to weep. Nay, touch me not, she said. They were but tears of anger. Meriamun is mistress of her fate, not fate of Meriamun. And now my lord awaits me, and I must be gone. Kiss me on the brow, old friend whilst yet I am the Meriamun thou knewest, and then kiss me no more for ever. At the least this is well for thee, for when Meriamun is queen of Kem, thou shalt be first in all the land, and stand on the footsteps of my throne. Farewell. And she gathered up her raiment, and cast her white flower of death in the flame of the brazier, and was gone leaving me yet sadder at heart. For now I knew that she was not as other women are, but greater for good or evil. On the morrow night I sat again at my task, and again there came a knocking at the door, and again a woman entered and threw aside her wrappings. It was Meriamun. She was pale and stern, and as I rose she waved me back. Has then the prince thy husband? I stammered. Speak not to me of the prince, Ray, my servant, she made answer. Yesterday I spoke to thee wildly. My mind was overwrought. Let it be forgotten. A wife am I, a happy wife. And she smiled so strangely that I shrunk back from her. Now to my errand. I have dreamed a dream, a troublous dream, and thou art wise and instructed. Therefore I pray thee, interpret my vision. I slept and dreamed of a man, and in my dream I loved him more than I can tell, for my heart beat to his heart, and in the light of him I lived, and all my soul was his and I knew that I loved him for ever, and Pharaoh was my husband, but in my dream I loved him not. Now there came a woman rising out of the sea, more beautiful than I, with a beauty fairer and more changeful than the dawn upon the mountains, and she too loved this godlike man, and he loved her. Then we strove together for his love, matching beauty against beauty, and wit against wit, and magic against magic. Now one conquered, and now the other, but in the end the victory was mine, and I went arrayed as for a marriage bed, and I clasped a corpse. I woke, and again I slept and saw myself wearing another garb, and speaking another tongue. Before me was the man I loved, and there too was the woman, wrapped about with beauty, and I was changed, and yet I was the very Meriamun thou seest. And once more we struggled for the mastery, and for this man's love, and in that day she conquered me. I slept, and again I woke, and in another land than Kem, a strange land, and yet methought I knew it from long ago. There I dwelt among the graves, and dark faces were about me, and I wore that thou knowest for a girdle, and the tombs of the rock wherein we dwelt were scored with the writings of a dead tongue the tongue of that land whence our fathers came. We were all changed, yet the same, 
and once more the woman and I struggled for the mastery, and though I seemed to conquer, yet a sea of fire came over me, and I woke, and I slept again. Then confusion was piled upon confusion, nor can my memory hold all that came to pass, for this game played itself afresh in lands and lives and tongues without number. Only the last bout and the winner were not revealed to me. And in my dream I cried aloud to the protecting gods to escape out of the dream, and I sought for light that I might see whence these things were. Then, as in a vision, the past opened up its gates. It seemed that upon a time, thousand, thousand ages agone, I and this man of my dream had arisen from nothingness and looked in each other's eyes and loved with a love unspeakable and vowed a vow that shall endure from time to time and world to world. For we were not mortal then, but partook of the nature of the gods, being more fair and great than any of humankind, and our happiness was the happiness of heaven. But in our great joy we hearkened to the voice of the that thou knowest, of that thing, Ray, with which, against thy counsel, I have but lately dealt. The kiss of our love awakened that which slept. The fire of our love warmed that which was a cold. We defied the holy gods, worshipping them not, but rather each the other. For we knew that as the gods we were eternal, and the gods were angered against us and drew us up into their presence. And while we trembled, they spake as with a voice. Ye twain who are one life, each completing each, because with your kisses ye have awakened that which slept and with the fire of your love have warmed that which was a cold, because ye have forgotten them that gave you life and love and joy. Hearken to your doom. From two be ye made three, and through all time strive ye to be twain again. Pass from this holy place down to the hell of earth, and though ye be immortal, put on the garments of mortality. Pass on from life to life, live and love and hate, and seem to die. Have acquaintance with every lot, and in your blind forgetfulness, being one and being equal, work each other's woe according to the law of earth. And for your love's sake, sin and be shamed, perish and rearise, appear to conquer and be conquered, pursuing your threefold destiny. And at the word of fate, the unaltering circle meets, and the veil of blindness falls from your eyes, and as a scroll, your folly is unrolled, and the hid purpose of your sorrow is accomplished, and once more ye are twain and one. Then, as we trembled, clinging each to each, again the great voice spoke. Ye twain who are one, let that to which ye have hearkened divide you and enfold you, be ye three. And as the voice spoke, I was torn with agony, and strength went out of me, and there, by him I loved, stood the woman of my dream, crowned with every glory and adorned with the star. And we were three, and between him and me, yet enfolding him and me, writhed that thing thou wottest of. And he whom I loved 
turned to look upon the fair woman, wondering, and she smiled and stretched out her arms towards him as one who would take that which is her own. And Ray, in that hour, though it was but in a dream, I knew the mortal pain of jealousy and awoke trembling. And now read thou this vision, Ray, thou who art learned in the interpretation of dreams and in the ways of sleep. O oh, lady, I made answer, this thing is too high for me, I cannot interpret it. But where thou art, there may I be to help thee. I know thy love, she said, but in thy words is little light, so, so, let it pass. It was but a dream, and if indeed it came from the underworld, why, it was from no helpful god, but rather from Set the Tormentor, or from Pasht the Terrible, who throws the creeping shadow of her doom upon the mirror of my sleep. For that which is decreed will surely come to pass. I am blown like the dust by the breath of fate, now to rest upon the temple's loftiest tops, now to be trodden under foot of slaves, and now to be swallowed by the bitter deep, and in season thence rolled forth again. I love not this lord of mine, who shall be Pharaoh, and never may he come whom I shall love. Tis well that I love him not, for to love is to be a slave. When the heart is cold, then the hand is strong, and I am fain to be the queen leading the pharaoh by the beard, the first of all the ancient land of Chem, for I was not born to serve. Nay, while I may, I rule, awaiting the end of rule. Look forth, Ray, and see how the rays from Mother Isis' throne flood all the courts and all the city's streets and break in light upon the water's breast. So shall the moon child's flame flood all this land of Chem. What matters it if ere the morn Isis must pass to her dominion of the dead and the voice of Meriamun be hushed within a sepulchre? So she spoke, and went thence, and on her face was no bride's smile, but rather such a gaze as that with which the great sphinx Horemku looks out across the desert sands. A strange queen, Ray, said the wanderer, as he paused. But what have I to make in this tale of a bride and her mad dreams? More than thou shalt desire, said Ray. But let us come to the end, and thou shalt hear thy part in the fate. End of Book One, Chapter Seven. Recording by Peter Kushney. Book One, Chapter Eight of The World's Desire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rick Vina. The World's Desire by H. Ryder Haggard. Book One, Chapter Eight. The Ka, the Bai, and the co. The divine pharaoh Ramses died and was gathered to Osiris. With these hands I closed his coffin and set him in his splendid tomb, where he shall rest unharmed for ever till the day of the awakening. And Meriamun and Menepta reigned in Chem. But to Pharaoh she was very cold, though he did her will in everything, and they had but one child, so that in a while 
he wearied of her loveliness. But hers was the master mind, and she ruled Pharaoh as she ruled all else. For me, my lot was bettered. She talked much with me, and advanced me to great dignity, so that I was the first master builder in Kem, and commander of the Legion of Amen. Now it chanced that Meriamun made a feast, where she entertained Pharaoh, and Hataska sat beside him. She was the first lady about the queen's person, a beautiful but insolent woman, who had gained Pharaoh's favor for the hour. Now wine worked so with the king, that he toyed openly with the lady Hataska's hand, but Meriamun the queen took no note, though Hataska, who had also drunk of the warm wine of the lower land, grew insolent, as was her wont. She quaffed deep from her cup of gold, and bade a slave bear it to the queen, crying, Pledge me, my sister. The meaning of her message was plain to all who heard. This waiting lady openly declared herself wife to Pharaoh, and an equal of the queen. Now Meriamun cared nothing for Pharaoh's love, but for power she did care, and she frowned while a light shone in her dark eyes. Yet she took the cup and touched it with her lips. Presently she lifted her own cup in turn and toyed with it, then made pretense to drink and said softly to the king's paramour who had pledged her pledge me in answer hataska my servant for soon methinks thou shalt be greater than the queen now this foolish woman read her saying wrong and took the golden cup from the eunuch who bore it with a little nod to the queen and a wave of her slim hand hataska drank and instantly, with a great cry, she fell dead across the board. Then, while all the company sat in terror, neither daring to be silent nor to speak, and while Meriamun smiled scornfully on the dark head lying low among the roses on the board, Pharaoh leaped up, mad with wrath and called to the guards to seize the queen. But she waved them back, and speaking in a slow, cold voice, she said, Dare not to touch Kem's anointed queen, lest your fate be as her fate. For thee, Menepta, forget not thy marriage oath. What, am I queen? and shall thy wantons throw their insolence in my teeth, and name me their sister? Not so, for if my eyes be blind, yet my ears are open. Peace, she is rightly served. Choose thou a lowlier mistress. And Pharaoh made no answer, for he feared her with an ever-growing fear. But she, sinking back in her seat of state, played with the gold kephir on her breast, and watched them bear the body forth to the house of Osiris. One by one all the company made obeisance, and passed thence, glad to be gone, till at the last there were left only Pharaoh and Meriamun the queen and myself, Ray the priest, for all were much afraid. Then Pharaoh spoke, looking neither at her nor at me, and half in fear, half in anger. Thou 
hateful woman. Accursed be the day when first I looked upon thy beauty. Thou hast conquered me, but beware, for I am still Pharaoh and thy lord. Cross my purpose once again, and by him who sleeps at Philae, I will discrown thee, and give thy body to the tormentors, and set thy soul loose to follow her whom thou hast slain. Then Meriamun answered proudly, Pharaoh, be warned, lift but one finger against my majesty, and thou art doomed. Thou canst not slay me, but I can overmatch thee, and I swear by the same oath, by him who sleeps at Philae, lift a hand against me, I harbor one thought of treachery, and thou diest. Not lightly can I be deceived, for I have messengers that thou canst not hear. Something, royal Menepta, do I know of the magic of that queen Taya who was before me. Now listen, do this one thing, and all shall be well. Go on thy path, and leave me to follow mine. Queen I am, queen I will remain, and in all matters of the state, mine must be an equal voice, though it is thine that speaks. And for the rest, we are apart henceforth, for thou fearest me, and Menepta, I love not thee, nor any man. As thou hast spoken, so be it, quoth Pharaoh, for his heart sank, and his fear came back upon him. Evil was the day when first we met, and this is the price of my desire. Henceforth we are apart in bed and board, but in the council we are still one, for our ends are one. I know thy power, Miriamun, thou gifted of the evil gods. Thou needest not fear that I shall seek to slay thee, for a spear cast against the heavens returns on him who threw it. Ray, my servant, thou art witness to our oaths. Hear now their undoing. Miriamun, the queen of ancient Chem, thou art no more wife of mine. Farewell. And he went heavily and stricken with fear. Nay, she said, gazing after him, no more am I Minepta's wife, but still am I Chem's dreaded queen. O oh, thou old priest, I am aweary. See what a lot is mine, who have all things but love, and yet am sick of all. I longed for power, and power is mine. And what is power? It is a rod wherewith we beat the air that straightway closes on the stroke. Yes, I tire of my loveless days, and of this dull round of common things. Oh, for one hour of love, and in that hour to die! Oh, that the future would lift its veil and disclose the face of time to be! Say, Ray, wilt thou be bold and dare a deed? And she clasped me by the sleeve, and whispered in my ear, in the dead tongue, known to her and me. Her I slew, thou sawest. I, queen, I saw, what of her? "'Twas ill done. "'Nay, 'twas rightly done, and well done, 
but thou knowest she is not yet cold nor for a while will be and i have the art to drag her spirit back ere she be cold from where she is and to force knowledge from her lips for being an osiris all the future is open to her in this hour nay nay i cried it is unholy not lightly may we disturb the dead lest the guardian gods be moved to anger yet will i do it ray if thou dost fear come not but i go i am fain for knowledge and thus only may i win it if i die in the dread endeavour write this of meriamun the queen that in seeking the to be she found it nay royal lady i answered thou shalt not go alone i too have some skill in magic and perchance can ward evil from thee so if indeed thou wilt dare this dreadful thing behold now as ever i am thy servant it is well see now the body will this night be laid in the sanctuary of the temple of osiris that is near the great gates as is the custom to await the coming of the embalmers come ere she be colder than my heart come with me ray to the house of the lord of the dead she passed to her chamber wrapped herself about in a dark robe and hurried with me to the temple doors where we were challenged by the guards who passes in the name of the holy osiris speak ray the master builder and the anointed priest and with him another i made answer open nay i open not there is one within who may not be wakened who then is within she whom the queen slew the queen sends one who would look on her she slew then the priest gazed on the hooded form beside me and started back crying a token noble ray i held up the royal signet and bowing he opened being come within the temple i lit the tapers that had been prepared then by their feeble light we passed through the outer hall till we came to the curtains that veil the sanctuary of the holy place and here i quenched the tapers for no fire must enter there save that which burns upon the altar of the dead but through the curtains came rays of light open said meriamun and i opened and hand in hand we passed in on the altar that is in the place the flame burnt brightly the chamber is not wide and great for this is the smallest of the temples of tennis but yet so large that the light could not reach its walls nor pierce the overhanging gloom and by much gazing scarcely could we discover the outline of the graven shapes of the holy gods that are upon the walls but the light fell clear upon the great statue of the osiris that was seated behind the altar fashioned in the black stone of Cyan, wound about with the corpse cloths wearing on his head the crown of the upper land and holding in his hands the crook of divinity and the awful scourge of punishment the light shone all about the white and dreadful shape that was placed upon his holy knees the naked shape of lost hataska 
who this night had died at the hand of Meriamun. There she bowed her head against the sacred breast, her long hair streaming down on either side, her arms tied across her heart, and her eyes, whence the hues of life had scarcely faded, widely staring at the darkness of the shrine. For at Tanis, to this day, it is the custom for a knight to place those of high birth or office who die suddenly upon the knees of the statue of Osiris. See, I said to the queen, speaking low, for the weight of the haunted place sank into my heart. See how she, who scarce an hour ago was but a lovely wanton, hath by thine act been clad in majesty greater than all the glory of the earth. Bethink thee, wilt thou dare indeed to summon back the spirit to the body whence thou hast set it free? Not easily, O queen, may it be done for all thy magic, and if perchance she answereth thee, it may well be that the terror of her words shall utterly o'erwhelm us. Nay, she made answer, I am instructed, I fear not, I know by what name to call the co that hovers on the threshold of the double hall of truth, and how to send it back to its own place. I fear not, but if perchance thou fearest, Ray, depart hence, and leave me to the task alone. Nay, I said, I also am instructed, and I go not, but I say to thee that this is unholy. Then Meriamun spoke no more, but lifting up her hands, she held them heavenwards, and so for a while she stood, her face fixed, as was the face of dead Hataska. Then, as must be done, I drew the circle round us, and round the altar, and the statue of Osiris, and that which sat upon his knee. With my staff I drew it, and standing therein, I said the holy words which should ward away the evil things that come near in such an hour. Now Meriamun threw a certain powder into the flame upon the altar. Thrice she threw the powder, and as she threw it, a ball of flame rose from the altar and floated away. Each time that she threw, did the ball of fire rise, and this it was needful to do, for by fire only may the dead be manifest, and therefore was a globe of fire given to each of the three shapes that together make the threefold spirit of the dead. And when the three globes of fire had melted into air, passing over the head of the statue of Osiris. Thrice did Meriamun cry aloud, Hataska, 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 by the dreadful name I summon thee, I summon thee from the threshold of the double hall, I summon thee from the gates of judgment, I summon thee from the door of doom, by the link of life and death, that is between thee and me, I bid thee come from where thou art, and make answer to that which I shall ask of thee. She ceased, but no answer came. Still the cold Osiris smiled, and still the body on his knee sat with open eyes, gazing into nothingness. 
not thus easily i whispered may this dreadful thing be done thou art instructed in the word of fear if thou darest let it pass thy lips or let us be gone nay it shall be spoken she said and thus she wrought passing to the statue she hid her head within her cloak and with both hands grasped the feet of the slain hataska seeing this i also crouched upon the floor and hid my face for it is death to hear that word with an uncovered face then in so soft a whisper that scarce had its breath stirred a feather on her lips meriamun spoke the word of fear which may not be written whose sound has power to pass all space and open the ears of the dead who dwell in amenti softly she said it for in a shout of thunder it was caught up and echoed from her lips and down the eternal halls it seemed to rush on the feet of storm and the wings of wind so that the roof rocked and the deep foundations of the temple quivered like a wind-stirred tree unveil ye mortals cried a dreadful voice and look upon the sight of fear that ye have dared to summon and i rose and cast my cloak from about my face and gazed then sank down in terror for round about the circle that i had drawn pressed all the multitude of the dead countless as the desert sands they pressed gazing with awful eyes upon us twain and the fire that was on the altar died away but yet was there light for it shone from those dead eyes and in the eyes of lost hataska there was light and ever the faces changed never for one beat of time did they cease to change for as we gazed upon a face it would melt even to the eyes and round these same eyes again would gather but no more the same and like the sloping sides of pyramids were the faces set about us from the ground to the temple roof and on us were fixed their glowing eyes and i ray being instructed knew that to suffer myself to be overcome with terror was death as it was death to pass without the circle so in my heart i called upon osiris lord of the dead to protect us and even as i named the ineffable name lo all the thousand thousand faces bent themselves in adoration and then turning looked each upon the other even as though each spake to each and changed and swiftly changed meriamun i said gathering up my strength fear not but beware nay wherefore should i fear she answered because the veil of sense is torn and for an hour we see those who are ever about our path and whose eyes watch our most secret thought continually i fear not and she stepped boldly even to the edge of the circle and cried all hail ye sahus spirits of the awful dead among whom i also shall be numbered and as she came the changing faces shrunk away leaving a space before her and in the space 
there grew two arms mighty and black that stretched themselves towards her until there was not the length of three grains of wheat betwixt the clutching fingers and her breast but meriamun only laughed and drew back a space not so thou enemy she said this circle thou mayst not break it is too strong for thee but to the work hataska once again by the link of life and death i summon thee and this time thou must come thou who wast a wanton and now art greater than the queen and as she spoke from the dead form of the woman on osiris's knee there issued forth another form and stood before us as a snake issues from its slough and as was the dead hataska so was this form feature for feature look for look and limb for limb but still the corpse rested upon osiris's knee for this was but the ka that stood before us and thus spoke the voice of hataska in the lips of the ka what wouldst thou with me who am no more of thy company o thou by whose hand my body did perish why troublest thou me and meriamun made answer i would this of thee that thou shouldest declare unto me the future even in the presence of this great company speak i command thee and the ka said nay meriamun that i cannot do for i am but the ka the dweller in the tomb the guardian of what was hataska whom thou didst slay whom i must watch through all the days of death till resurrection is of the future i know not seek thou that which knows stand thou on one side quoth the queen and the dweller in the tomb obeyed then once more she called upon hataska and there came a sound of rushing wings and behold on the head of the statue of osiris sat a great bird feathered as it were with gold but the bird had the head of a woman and the face was fashioned as the face of hataska and thus it spoke that was the by what wouldst thou with me meriamun who am no more of thy company why dost thou draw me from the underworld thou by whose hand my body did perish and meriamun said this i would of thee that thou shouldest declare unto me the future speak i command thee and the bai said nay meriamun that i cannot do i am but the bai of her who was hataska and i fly from death to life and life to death till the hour of awakening is of the future i know not seek thou that which knows rest thou where thou art quoth the queen and there it rested awful to see then once more meriamun called upon hataska bidding her hear the summons where she was and behold the eyes of the dead one that was upon the knee of osiris glowed and glowed the eyes of the dweller in the tomb and of the winged messenger who sat above and then there was a sound as the sound of wind and from above cleaving the darkness 
descended a tongue of flame and rested on the brow of the dead Hataska, and the eyes of all the thousand thousand spirits turned and gazed upon the tongue of flame and then dead Hataska spoke though her lips moved not yet she spoke and this she said what wouldst thou with me meriamun who am no more of thy company why dost thou dare to trouble me thou by whose hand my body did perish, drawing me from the threshold of the double hall of truth back to the over-world. And Meriamun the queen said, O oh, thou Ko, for this purpose have I called thee. I am aweary of my days, and I fain would learn the future. The future fain would i learn but the forked tongue of that which sleeps tells me no word and the lips of that which is a cold are dumb tell me then thou i charge thee by the word that has power to open the lips of the dead thou who in all things art instructed what shall be the burden of my days and the dread co made answer love shall be the burden of thy days and death shall be the burden of thy love behold one draws near from out the north whom thou hast loved whom thou shalt love from life to life till all things are accomplished bethink thee of a dream that thou dreamedst as thou didst lie on pharaoh's bed and read its riddle meriamun thou art great and thy name is known upon the earth and in amenti is thy name known high is thy fate and through blood and sorrow shalt thou find it i have spoken let me hence it is well, the queen made answer, but not yet mayest thou go hence. First I command thee, by the word of dread, and by the link of life and death, declare unto me, if here upon the earth, and in this life, I shall possess him whom I shall love. In sin and craft and sorrow meriamun thou shalt possess him in shame and jealous agony he shall be taken from thee by one who is stronger than thou though thou art strong by one more beautiful than thou though thou art beautiful and ruin thou shalt give him for his guerdon and ruin of the heart shalt thou harvest for thy portion but for this time she shall escape thee whose footsteps march with thine and with his who shall be thine and hers nevertheless in a day to come thou shalt pay her back measure for measure and evil for evil i have spoken let me hence not yet o ko not yet i have still to learn show me the face of her who is mine enemy and the face of him who is my love thrice mayest thou speak to me o thou greatly daring answered the dread ko and thrice i may make reply and then farewell till I meet thee on the threshold of the hall whence thou hast drawn me. Look now on the face of that Hataska whom thou slewest. And we looked, and behold the face of dead Hataska changed, and changed the face of the double, the Ka that stood on one side, and the face of the great bird, the Bai, 
that spread his wings about the head of Osiris, and they grew beautiful, yes, most exceeding beautiful, so that it cannot be told, and the beauty was that of a woman asleep. Then, lo, there hung above Hataska, as it were, the shadow of one who was watching her sleeping, and his face we saw not. O oh, thou wanderer, it was hidden by the visor of a golden two-horned helm, and in that helm stood fast the bronze point of a broken spear but he was clad in the armor of the people of the northern sea, the Aquayusha, and his hair fell dark about his shoulders like the petals of the hyacinth flower. Behold thine enemy, and behold thy love. Farewell, said the dread Ko, speaking through dead Hataska's lips, and as the words died, the beauty faded, and the tongue of flame shot upwards and was lost, and once more the eyes of the thousand thousand dead turned and looked upon each other, even as though their lips whispered, each to each. But for a while Meriamun stood silent, as one amazed, then awaking she waved her hand and cried, Begone, thou by, begone, thou ka. And the great bird whereof the face was as the face of Hataska spread his golden wings and passed away to his own place, and the ka that was in the semblance of Hataska drew near to the dead one's knees and passed back into her from whom she came, and all the thousand thousand faces melted, though the fiery eyes still gazed upon us. Then Meriamun covered her head, and once more spoke the awful word, and I also covered up my head. But as must be done, this second time she called the word aloud, and yet, though she called it loud, it came but as a tiny whisper from her lips. Nevertheless, at the sound of it, once more was the temple shaken as by a storm. Then Meriamun unveiled, and behold, again the fire burned upon the altar, and on the knees of the Osiris sat Hataska, cold and still in death, and round them was emptiness and silence. Now that all is done, I greatly fear for that which has been, and that which shall be. Lead me hence, O Ray, son of Pames, for I can no more. And so with a heavy heart I led her forth, who of all sorceresses is the very greatest. Behold, thou wanderer, wherefore the queen was troubled at the coming of the man in the armor of the north, in whose two-horned golden helm stands fast the point of a broken spear. End of Book One, Chapter Eight. Book Two, Chapter One of The World's Desire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Cushney. The World's Desire by H. Ryder Haggard. Book Two, Chapter One. The Prophets of the Opera. 
These things are not without the gods, said the wanderer, who was called Epiratus, when he had heard all the tale of Ray the priest, son of Pames, the head architect, the commander of the legion of Amen. Then he sat silent for a while, and at last raised his eyes and looked upon the old man. Thou hast told a strange tale, Ray. Over many a sea have I wandered, and in many a land have I sojourned. I have seen the ways of many peoples, and have heard the voices of the immortal gods. Dreams have come to me, and marvels have compassed me about. It has been laid upon me to go down into Hades, that land which thou namest Amenti, and to look on the tribes of the dead. But never till now have I known so strange a thing. For mark thou, when first I beheld this fair queen of thine, I thought she looked upon me strangely, as one who knew my face. And now, Ray, if thou speakest truth, she deems that she has met me in the ways of night and magic. Say then, who was the man of the vision of the queen, the man with dark and curling locks, clad in golden armor, after the fashion of the Achaeans, whom ye name the Aquaiusha, wearing on his head a golden helm, wherein was fixed a broken spear. Before me sits such a man, said Ray, or perchance it is a god that my eyes behold. No god am I, quoth the wanderer, smiling, though the Sidonians deemed me nothing less when the black bow twanged and the swift shafts flew. Read me the riddle, thou that art instructed. Now the aged priest looked upon the ground, then turned his eyes upward, and with muttering lips prayed to Toth, the god of wisdom. And when he had made an end of prayer, he spoke. Thou art the man, he said. Out of the sea thou hast come to bring the doom of love on the Lady Meriamun, and on thyself the doom of death. This I knew, but of the rest I know nothing. Now I pray thee, O thou who comest in the armor of the north, thou whose face is clothed in beauty, and who art of all men the mightiest, and hast of all men the sweetest and most guileful tongue, go back, go back into the sea whence thou camest, and the lands whence thou hast wandered. Not thus easily may men escape their doom, quoth the wanderer. My death may come, as come it must, but know this, Ray, I do not seek the love of Meriamun. Then it well may chance that thou shalt find it, for ever those who seek love lose, and those who seek not find. I am come to seek another love, said the wanderer, and I seek her till I die. Then I pray the gods that thou mayest find her, and that Kem may thus be saved from sorrow. But here in Egypt there is no woman so fair as Meriamun, and thou must seek farther as quickly as may be. And now, Epiratus, behold, I must away to do service in the temple of the Holy Amen, for I am his high priest. But I am commanded by Pharaoh first to bring thee to the feast at the palace. Then he led the wanderer from his chamber, and brought him by a side entrance to the great palace of the Pharaoh at Tanis, near the temple of Ptah. And first he took him to a chamber that had been made ready for him in the palace, a beautiful chamber, richly painted with beast-headed gods, and furnished with ivory chairs, and couches of ebony and silver, and with a gilded bed. Then the wanderer went into the shining baths, and dark-eyed girls bathed him, and anointed him with fragrant oil, and crowned him with lotus flowers. 
When they had bathed him, they bade him lay aside his golden armor and his bow and the quiver full of arrows. But this the wanderer would not do, for as he laid the black bow down, it thrilled with a thin sound of war. So Ray led him, armed as he was, to a certain antechamber, and there he left him, saying that he would return again when the feast was done. Trumpets blared as the wanderer waited, drums rolled, and through the wide throne curtains swept the lovely Meriamon and the divine pharaoh Meneptah, with many lords and ladies of the court, all crowned with roses and with lotus blooms. The queen was decked in royal attire, her shining limbs were veiled in broidered silk, about her shoulders was a purple robe, and round her neck and arms were rings of well-wrought gold. She was stately and splendid to see, with pale brows and beautiful disdainful eyes where dreams seemed to sleep beneath the shadow of her eyelashes. On she swept in all her state and pride of beauty, and behind her came the pharaoh. He was a tall man, but ill-made and heavy-browed, and to the wanderer it seemed that he was heavy-hearted too, and that care and terror of evil to come were always in his mind. Meriamun looked up swiftly. Greeting, stranger, she said. Thou comest in warlike guise to grace our feast. Methought, royal lady, he made answer, that anon, when I would have laid it by, this bow of mine sang to me of present war. Therefore I am come armed, even to thy feast. Hast thy bow such foresight, Epiratus? said the queen. I have heard but once of such a weapon and that in a minstrel's tale. He came to our court with his lyre from the northern sea, and he sang of the bow of Odysseus. Minstrel or not, thou does well to come armed, wanderer, said the pharaoh. For if thy bow sings, my own heart mutters much to me of war to be. Follow me, wanderer however it fall out, said the queen. So he followed her and the pharaoh till they came to a splendid hall, carven round with images of fighting and feasting. Here, on the painted walls, Ramesses Miamun drove the thousands of the Kita before his single valor. Here men hunted wild fowl through the marshes with a great cat for their hound. Never had the wanderer beheld such a hall since he supped with the sea king of the fairy isle. On the dais, raised above the rest, sat the pharaoh, and by him sat Meriamun the queen, and by the queen sat the wanderer in the golden armor of Paris, and he leaned the black bow against his ivory chair. Now the feast went on, and men ate and drank. The queen spoke little, but she watched the wanderer beneath the lids of her deep-fringed eyes. Suddenly, as they feasted and grew merry, the doors at the end of the chamber were thrown wide. The guards fell back in fear, and behold, at the end of the hall stood two men. Their faces were tawny, dry, wasted with desert wandering. Their noses were hooked like eagles' beaks, and their eyes were yellow as the eyes of lions. They were clad in rough skins of beasts, girdled about their waists with leathern thongs, and fiercely they lifted their naked arms and waved their wands of cedar. Both men were old. One was white-bearded, the other was shaven smooth like the priests of Egypt. As they lifted the rods on high, the guards shrank like beaten hounds, and all the guests hid their faces, save Meriamun and the wanderer alone. Even Pharaoh dared not look on them, but he murmured angrily in his beard. By the name of Osiris, he said, 
Here be those soothsayers of the opera once again. Now death waits on those who let them pass the doors. Then one of the two men, he who was shaven like a priest, cried with a great voice, Pharaoh, 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 hearken to the word of Javeh. Wilt thou let the people go? I will not let them go, he answered. Pharaoh, 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 hearken to the word of Javeh. If thou wilt not let the people go, then shall all the firstborn of Chem, of the prince and the slave, of the ox and the ass, be smitten of Javeh. Wilt thou let the people go? Now Pharaoh hearkened, and those who were at the feast rose and cried with a loud voice, O oh, Pharaoh, let the people go. Great woes are fallen upon Chem because of the opera. O oh, Pharaoh, let the people go. Now Pharaoh's heart was softened, and he was minded to let them go. But Meriamun turned to him and said, Thou shalt not let the people go. It is not these slaves, nor the god of these slaves, who bring the plagues on Chem, but it is that strange goddess, the false Hathor, who dwells here in the city of Tanis. Be not so fearful. Ever hadst thou a coward heart. Drive the false Hathor thence, if thou wilt, but hold these slaves to their bondage. I still have cities that must be built, and yon slaves shall build them. Then the Pharaoh cried, Hence I bid you, hence, and tomorrow shall your people be laden with a double burden, and their backs shall be red with stripes. I will not let the people go. Then the two men cried aloud and pointing upward with their staffs, they vanished from the hall, and none dared to lay hands upon them. But those who sat at the feast murmured much. Now the wanderer marveled why Pharaoh did not command the guards to cut down these unbidden guests who spoiled his festival. The Queen Meriamun saw the wonder in his eyes, and turned to him. Know thou, Epiritus, she said, that great plagues have come of late on this land of ours, plagues of lice and frogs and flies and darkness, and the changing of pure waters to blood. And these things our lord the Pharaoh deems have been brought upon us by the curse of yonder magicians, conjurers, and priests among certain slaves who work in the land at the building of our cities. But I know well that the curses come on us from Hathor, the Lady of Love, because of that woman who hath set herself up here in Tanis, and is worshipped as the Hathor. Why then, O Queen, said the wanderer, is this false goddess suffered to abide in your fair city? For, as I know well, the immortal gods are ever angered with those who turn from their worship to bow before strange altars. Why is she suffered? Nay, ask of Pharaoh, my lord. Methinks it is because her beauty is more than the beauty of women. So the men say who have looked on it, but I have not seen it, for only those men see it who go to worship at her shrine, and then from afar. It is not meet that the queen of all the lands should worship at the shrine of a strange woman, come, like thyself, Epiritus, from none knows where. If indeed she be a woman, and not a fiend from the underworld. But if thou wouldest learn more, ask my lord the pharaoh, for he knows the shrine of the false Hathor, and he knows who guard it. And what is it that bars the way? Now the wanderer turned to Pharaoh, saying, O Pharaoh, may I know the truth of this mystery? Then Maneptah looked up, and there was doubt and trouble on his heavy face. I will tell thee readily, thou wanderer, 
For perchance such a man as thou, who hast travelled many lands and seen the faces of many gods, may understand the tale, and may help me. In the days of my father, the holy Ramesses Miamun, the keepers of the temple of the divine Hathor awoke, and lo, in the sanctuary of the temple was a woman in the garb of the Aquayusha, who was beauty's self. But when they looked upon her, none could tell the semblance of her beauty, for to one she seemed dark and to the other fair, and to each man of them she showed a diverse loveliness. She smiled upon them and sang most sweetly, and love entered their hearts, so that it seemed to each man that she only was his heart's desire. But when any man would have come nearer and embraced her, there was that about her which drove him back. And if he strove again, behold, he fell down dead. So at last they subdued their hearts and desired her no more, but worshipped her as the Hathor come to earth, and made offerings of food and drink to her and prayers. So three years passed. And at the end of the third year, the keepers of the temple looked, and the Hathor was gone. Nothing remained of her but a memory. Yet there were some who said that this memory was dearer than all else that the world has to give. Twenty more seasons went by, and I sat upon the throne of my father, and was lord of the double crown. And on a day... A messenger came running and cried, Now is Hathor come back to Kem, now is Hathor come back to Kem, and, as of old, none may draw near her beauty. Then I went to see, and lo, before the temple of Hathor a great multitude was gathered, and there on the pylon brow stood the Hathor's self shining with changeful beauty like the dawn. And as of old she sang sweet songs, and to each man who heard, her voice was the voice of his own beloved, living and lost to him, or dead and lost. Now every man has such a grave in his heart as that whence Hathor seems to rise in changeful beauty. Month by month she sings thus, one day in every month, and many a man has sought to win her and her favor. But in the doorways are they who meet him and press him back. And if he struggles on, there comes a clang of swords, and he falls dead, but no wound is found on him. And wanderer, this is truth, for I myself have striven and have been pressed back by that which guards her. But I alone of men who have looked on her and heard her strove not a second time, and so saved myself alive. Thou alone of men lovest life more than the world's desire, said the queen. Thou hast ever sickened for the love of this strange witch, but thy life thou lovest even better than her beauty, and thou dost not dare attempt again the adventure of her embrace. No, Epiritus, that this sorrow is come upon the land, that all men love yonder witch and rave of her, and to each she wears a different face and sings in another voice. When she stands upon the pylon tower, then thou wilt see the madness with which she has smitten them, for they will weep and pray and tear their hair. Then they will rush through the temple courts and up to the temple doors and be thrust back again by that which guards her. But some will yet strive madly on and thou wilt hear the clash of arms and they will fall dead before thee. Accursed is the land, I tell thee, wanderer. Because of that phantom it is accursed, for it is she who brings these woes on Kem. From her, not from our slaves and their mad conjurers, come plagues, I say, and all evil things. 
until a man be found who may pass her guard and come face to face with the witch and slay her plagues and woes and evil things shall be the daily bread of Kem. perchance wanderer thou art such a man and she looked on him strangely yet if so this is my counsel that thou not go up against her lest thou also be bewitched and a great man be lost to us now the wanderer turned the matter over in his heart and made answer perchance lady my strength and the favor of the gods might serve me in such a quest but methinks that this woman is meeter for words of love and the kisses of men than to be slain with the sharp sword if indeed she be not of the number of the immortals now Meriamun flushed and frowned it is not fitting so to talk before me she said of this be sure that if the witch may be come at she shall be slain and given to osiris for a bride now the wanderer saw that the lady Meriamun was jealous of the beauty and renown and love of her who dwelt in the temple and was called the strange hathor and he held his peace for he knew when to be silent end of book two chapter one recording by peter kushney